OK, um, what I really want to talk about today is explanations. And let me start first by explaining who I am. Uh, my name is Russ Olson. I work for a company called Relevance. It's headquartered in North Carolina. I live in Virginia, where it's very humid. And I'm now here, where it's very not. Um, I've written two books, and I'm working on a third. And I hope you will buy many, many copies of them. Um, but I didn't always start out as a, as a programmer. It's funny, we all raised our hands yesterday. Do, who has a BS in computer science? I have a BS in mechanical engineering. Um, and I started there, there's a few refugees. And I, so I started out doing things with gears and, and bearings and you know, that kind of stuff. And one of, the things, one of the things I found frustrating about that was you were always up against limits. There's always a limit in mechanical engineering. There's friction on the gears. The bearings will only take so much weight, and then they'll fail. Um, your heat engines are only so efficient. And so you get equations like this, which are just all about the limits of what you can do. And in particular, that middle one, which is the efficiency of a heat engine, is built into the fabric of the universe. It's one of the fundamental laws of physics, and there's no getting around that. And it was really frustrating, because I always felt like there were things I wanted to do, but I couldn't do them, because there were these limits. And so I wandered in the computer programming. And one of the, I mean, I guess one of the attractions was I didn't feel, even a long, long time ago when I first started, that there were the same kind of limits that there are in mechanical engineering. So I'd like to start with the question, which is, what are the limits? to what we can do, right? We do all kinds of wonderful stuff, but we can't do nearly what we want to do. What are the limits, right? Well, I could think of one possibility. There's something that might be limiting us. <laughs> or maybe it's guys in funny hats. Or maybe it's these three guys. But you know what? I think it's all of us. We make things out of ideas. Our tools are abstractions. Our raw material is data, right? Yes, we have, you know, the CPUs are only as fast as the CPUs are. There's only so much memory and only so much disk space. But in the end, the thing that limits us is ourselves. The thing that limits what we do is what we have up here in our heads. And you know, you sat through yesterday afternoon where people were talking about struggling to learn the things that we do. That's the limit, OK? And I want you to just think for a second about what the world would be like if we were all just a little bit smarter, OK? If we were all just 5% smarter, if we all just knew 5% more than we do right now, what could we do? Well, the only way that we can get smarter is to explain things to each other, OK? You all know stuff, right? And you all know different stuff, and I know some things. And the only way we can get the stuff, the information from my head into your head, if it's at all difficult, is to explain it, right? And I'm not talking about, you know, what I'm doing here is the least important kind of explaining that can be done. It's the least important because it doesn't happen very often. The important kind of explaining is the stuff that you do when you're walking down the hall and you get a coworker and he says or she says, how does this work? And you tell them. That's the important kind of explaining. Because if you get that right, if you get that right, then they'll be more efficient at their job and they'll make your company better. You know, we think of like, um, if you're in a startup, and you're doing a sales pitch, we think of that as sort of sales. That's not sales, that's explaining. You are explaining why someone should invest in your company or why they should buy your product. That's the important kind of explaining. How does this work? What does this function do? How does this class work? It's that day-to-day -day stuff, just the overwhelming volume of it that is the important explaining that goes on. So what I'd like to do today is talk about five ways to make your explanations stick, to have good explanations, explanations that actually work. Because there's actually sort of an art to explaining things. So number one, number one 
is to take it seriously. Need to take explaining seriously. Why? Well, because you do the right kind of explaining, and as I said, you can almost change the world, right? You could certainly make your, your, the systems you're working on better, make them easier to sell, so we need to take it seriously. And when technical people take things seriously, there's only one thing they do. They have a plan, okay? If you think about who we are and how we go about our lives, we don't do anything without a plan. Okay? If you think about what agile programming is, agile programming is both the most important advance we've made in, I don't know, 15 years in how we do what we do, and it's also, it can be boiled down to stop over planning everything. Okay? Stop planning and actually do it. When we take something seriously, we have a plan. Unfortunately, um, there's a default plan for explaining things. The default plan comes to you courtesy of this guy. That is James Joyce. James Joyce wrote these long stream of consciousness, completely incomprehensible novels. And his plan is the default plan for an explanation. How does the system work? Well, let's see. I start talking about the last thing I worked on, or the first thing, or the part I like best, or the part I like least, the last bug I fixed, the first bug I fixed. Right? Not the important stuff, just whatever happens to be boiling around in my head. That's James Joyce stream of consciousness kind of uh, explanations, and it doesn't really work very well. A better plan is the zoom, the zoom in plan. Okay? You start with the big picture, and you work your way down to the little picture. Because explaining is not just information. It's information with sort of a candy coating of context that helps people get the information into their heads, okay? And by zooming in, by using the zoom in plan, you can supply the context. So what's the zoom in plan? It's pretty obvious. You start with the big picture and you go to the little picture. Start with the earth and work your way down to the theater. It's a beautiful theater here today. Um, how does the, you know, what, what are we doing here? Well, we're trying to get filthy rich. We're trying to build this e-commerce site. We need a shopping cart. We need this screen to be part of the shopping cart. It's as simple as that, okay? The greatest top-down, context-setting, big picture to little picture explanation that I can think of comes from this guy, Abraham Lincoln. The most famous speech in probably US political history starts with these words. And we tend not to think about them, right? They were drilled into you in fifth grade if you went to school here. Um, but if you think about what he's saying here, he's saying 87 years ago, the country was founded. The United States was founded. So he's starting big picture. He's starting with the beginning of the country. Now we're engaged in a great civil war. What's been going on in the last few years? We're here to dedicate a cemetery here this afternoon. He goes from the beginning of the country to what are we doing here today in three sentences. That's like first class, top down context setting. Okay, you do worse than emulate Abraham Lincoln. A, second, a different kind of plan, so you can just kind of reverse it, right? Zoom out, start with the little picture. We're building this screen because we need, or this page because we need a shopping cart, because we are building an e-commerce site, because we want to get filthy rich, right? It's very simple. Um, so go to the other way. Another kind of explanation is a process explanation, right? How does something work step by step by step, right? How does Rails handle a request? Well, it comes in, it gets routed to the right controller, the controller consults the model, sends it on to the view, the view formats the data, sends it back out. That's a process explanation. Process explanations are good plans for processes, and depending on your age and how much TV you watched as a kid, you'll recognize this process explanation or not. This, is, this was Schoolhouse Rock. It was trying to explain how a bill becomes a law in the US, and there was a little character he's sitting there named Bill, and he would go through the motions of, you know, Congress passes it and the president signs it kind of thing. Um, so process explanation. There's also, and again, none of this is rocket science, but it's something to think about. There's the simple to complex. So 
If you're trying to explain this bit of code to somebody, what do you say about it? Well, it depends on who the somebody is. You would say one thing to an experienced Ruby developer, you'd say something different um, to an absolute beginner. To an absolute beginner, do you know what I say? And I've said this many times. What is that? It's a loop. That's how we do loops in Ruby. Well, maybe. Actually, it's a call to the each method, which takes a block, which is actually a closure, which captures the values of the, no, that is not what you say to a beginner. What you say to a beginner is, it's a loop. You say it's a loop, and then you know you're gonna come back once they've written their first few Ruby programs and maybe have a clue about blocks and things, you come back and you say, oh, well, let's talk about those loops and why they look funny. Don't try to explain everything all at the same time because you'll end up explaining nothing forever, right? So you can summarize this strategy um, for explaining with one simple word, you lie, right? <laughs> You lie for good cause, but you lie. Now, in particular, you'll get in trouble with these kind of little white lies, not from the beginners who will love you and kiss you on the mouth for making it simple so they can get off the ground. You will get in trouble from the experts. Somebody who really knows it will come by and say, bah, that's not a loop. That's a call to the each method, passing in a block. So I got an additional bit of advice for when you come across those situations. <laughs> right. Explaining is so important that you lie, cheat, steal, you do anything to get it across. And if, you're, if you offend some, of the, some people who don't have a clue about explaining, that's okay. They might be an expert in Ruby, but they probably don't know how to explain things, right? Of course, when you tell the lie, make sure you go back and untell the lie at some point, so then it's not really a lie. So that's number one, have a plan for your explanations. Number two is be agile. What's it mean to be agile with an explanation? Do you have unit tests? Do you drill into people's heads, you know, the people you explain to and put little electrodes in there and see if they got it? Probably not, that's kind of a, well, it would be a slow running test anyway. Um, being agile really, if you get down to the core of what it means to be agile, it's you do it, you measure it, you fix it, and you repeat. That's what being agile is. So how do you measure the results of an explanation? How do you know if your explanation is actually working? Right, because to do it isn't hard, right? You stand up there and explain. To fix it, right, we can figure out if it's not working, we can do something else, we can certainly repeat it. It's the measuring part. Well, I'm sorry that I have to say this, but I've seen enough people inflict enough failing explanations and not, measure, not see the signs that it's failing. So let me give you three signs that your explanation is failing. They look at you funny, there's silence, or even more key, they start asking the same questions over and over and over. I don't, I don't get this. Well, what about this? I'm just not sure about this, okay? That's a flag that they're not getting this and that you should do something different where something different is not just do exactly the same thing over and over again. But the key thing is that when your explanations start to fail, you need to keep something in mind. It's you, not them. I work for a company called Relevance, as I said, and we have this thing, right? We don't just want to be good at stuff. We don't want to be great at stuff. We want to be awesome at stuff. And so we're always asking ourselves, yeah, we're kind of full of ourselves. Um, we're always asking ourselves, what would be awesome here? So what's awesome in an explanation? Awesome in an explanation is not take this person who's sort of familiar with Rails or whatever, and get them up to the next level. That's good, that's not bad, it's just not awesome. Awesome is also not take this person who's sort of familiar with whatever it is and get them up to the next level really, really quickly. That's not awesome, that's, that's better, but it's not awesome. Awesome in an explanation is to take someone who has no clue and give them a clue. It is to take someone who doesn't have the context 
and get them going. And the good news is that there's a single failure mode that most explanations suffer. So that when you start to get those blank looks and the same question over and over and over, you can think that I've probably got a gap in my explanation. Okay, so what's a gap in an explanation? It's, it has to do with the way we learn things. If you're trying to learn Spanish, right, when you first are learning Spanish, any, really anything, but I'll take Spanish as an example, when you're trying to learn Spanish and you need the Spanish word for red, initially you go through this painful, conscious lookup process. What's the word for red? The Spanish word for red is rojo, and that's not how you pronounce it, but the heck with it. Um, and you do this conscious sort of lookup thing. Later on, when you become fluent, when you're really good at it, you just conjure up the word for Spanish, you, or in Spanish. You've internalized the information. You don't even think about it anymore. And that happens in programming all the time. You see, learn a new programming language, and at first it's painful, it's horrible. Everything is a fight. And then you get good at it, and you've just forgotten that there's anything to know. And that's great for learning things. It's terrible for explaining things. Because experts know it so well, they forget that there's anything to know. And I think we were talking about this yesterday. Somebody said, actually said this up on the stage, that there's, you know, a string is not what you people think it is, right? That's an example of this, right? So that's the gap. It, it, a gap in your explanation comes when you don't realize that you know something and you skip right over it. And it just leaves this chasm in your explanation. Right? And I'll give you a ex personal example of that. About six months ago, me and a friend of mine, a guy named Dave Bach, did something very akin to uh, what we were talking about yesterday. We kind of said, if you want to learn Ruby on Rails, come see us every Tuesday night. We'll take about 30 people, and we will do our darndest to try and help you learn it. And we got a whole bunch of people, some with a lot of programming experience, some with almost no programming experience. None of them knew anything about Ruby. None of them knew anything about Rails. And we tried to teach them. So I want you to put yourself in my shoes. If you had somebody who doesn't know anything about Ruby or Rails, what's the first thing you teach them? What do you say that first day, that first evening, the first hour, the first 10 minutes? Talk about model view controller, tell them how to install Ruby, bundler, RVM, I don't know, controllers, active record, right? There's a million things you could start with. And I think we started with like installing Ruby or Rails or something. And there were three or four people and they all happened to be clustered in the back of the room and they just were not getting it. I mean, it was the same questions over and over in the blank stares and the sort of confused dog on an angle head kind of look. And I knew it wasn't working. And I kept trying different things and it just wasn't working. And finally, I almost saw like, I saw like the imaginary light bulb go on and over this woman's head. And she said, oh, and it was like she had jumped the gap. She had figured it out. And I'm like, great, what is this going to be? And she said, oh, Ruby is the language, Rails is the framework. <laughs> well, duh. But you know what? Nobody in this room was born with that information coded into their DNA. Somebody explained that to every single one of us. And here's the good news. Once you find one of these gaps, Ruby is the language, Rails is the framework, hold on to it. That's gold. That's the thing that no one else is explaining. That's the thing that you can explain that no one else is explaining because it's disappeared from sight of all the people who know this, okay? And furthermore, you can explain it to the explainers. Make sure when you teach them, mention this, right? Rails is the framework. Okay, so that's number two, mind the gaps, okay? Number three, takes me into sports, which is not a place I wanna go. I am not a sports-involved person. My wife made me watch an hour of the Olympics this summer, and I enjoyed all but like the last 55 minutes of it. Um, but I have a theoretical knowledge of sports. 
And one of the things I know is that there's two different kinds of sporting games. There's one kind, which is baseball, and tennis, and golf, and maybe a few others. And then there's the football kind, which includes hockey, and basketball, and soccer, and a few others. Baseball, you play it till it's done, right? Nine innings, right? If it takes two hours, great. It takes four hours, great. It takes as long as it takes, but you go through all the steps, and then you're done. Football, there's clock. 60 minutes, 59 minutes, basketball's like that, hockey's like that. So the question is, what kind of sport is explaining? We tend to treat it like it's baseball. All right, I've got this subject to explain. I don't know, Ruby on Rails. So I'm going to start in the inning one. I'm going to start with, uh, oh, maybe the stateless nature of the HTTP protocol. And then I'm going to move on to basic object-oriented programming in inning two. Inning three is going to be all about routing and pattern matching, because routing does a lot of pattern matching. Inning four, maybe I'll talk about models. Inning five, and maybe somewhere around inning seven, we'll write our first Ruby application or Rails application, right? You could see somebody doing that. In fact, it's not going to work because somewhere around inning two, everyone's fallen asleep, OK? Nobody cares anymore, right? Explaining is a timed event. There is a clock. The clock runs. When the clock is done, you are done explaining. Oh, you might be moving your lips. There might be sound coming out of your mouth. <laughs> but you're done, right? Where's the clock? It's in the head of the person who you're explaining things to, right? All of us have a limit on how much information we can take in, every single one of us, right? It's different on different days. It's different for different people. I suspect. <laughs> that having gone through a two-day conference, your limit right now is a little lower than it was when you started, right? You just get overwhelmed, right? So what does it mean? Like, what can we glean from the fact that there's a clock running in an explanation? How about this? Put the important stuff first, right? If you want them to know something, stick it in the front. Ben did this yesterday, right? Ben said, if he started this talk by saying, if there's one thing you want to re remember from this talk, it's, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> but, and he put it in the front. <laughs> another key thing, <laughs> another key thing, is that terminology is not the important stuff. Okay, terminology, when you're explaining something, especially to a beginner, is not the key thing. Terminology is important. Okay, terminology is the, is the tool, it's like a scalpel that an expert will use to separate the merely plausible from the actually correct. Okay, but to a beginner, it's just an impediment. Okay, especially given that if you put the terminology first, that's all they might get. Here, here's an example. So you ever go to the eye doctor and they say better, worse, better, worse, right? So we're going to do a better, worse. All right, got about 20 seconds and you need to explain computer uh, security. A couple of the concepts in computer security. Authentication and authorization. Even better, they both sound alike. That's always good, right? So here we go. Here's better, worse, alternative one. In computer security, there's these two related but distinct concepts called authentication and authorization. <clears throat> what have you really done? Absolutely nothing. There's a couple of A words or something, right? That's what a, a listener would get from that. Try this again. In computer security, there's two things that are important. Who is the person and what are they allowed to do? <clears throat> Which one would you rather have your office mate walk away with? One's important, one's just terminology. Explain the terminology, do it later. Do it in another session. Do it at the beginning of a conference. <laughs> the, the other good news about the clock is that it's variable. Sometimes it runs faster, sometimes it runs slower. Sometimes you can actually reset it, give yourself 20 or 30 seconds more, or five minutes more. How do you do that? 
Well, here's how you make the clock run faster. Here's how you, you run out of time and make sure you don't get to explain anything before the clock hits zero. Tell them that. This is really hard, okay? This next one I'm not making up. I actually sat in the back of a classroom and heard somebody say this, the instructor in the front of the classroom. Most people never get this. Hi, you're gonna spend four hours with me and you're screwed. <laughs> So what do you do to make the clock run slower, maybe push it back? You give people small victories, right? You got something hard, tell them after. The whole thing about the plans with the, uh, with the explanations, that's really the hardest thing I'm gonna tell you today. Right? That's what you do. You don't tell them this is gonna be hard. You tell them, congratulations, you just learned something hard, past tense, right? Also, you can break it up. If you can break things up into manageable chunks, that really helps. I like the five ways to do something kind of thing, you may have noticed. Okay. So that's um, watching the clock. So next one, number four. You're a bunch of engineers. What's that mean? Don't repeat yourself. We love don't repeat yourself. Even back in my mechanical engineering days, we were smart enough to know don't put extra stuff in the machines. It'll just break, it'll get in the way, it costs more, it's all the same. When you're building a mechanism, you don't want to have extraneous stuff. So don't repeat yourself. So that's what dry means. But you know what? If you look up dry in the dictionary, it means some other things. Having no adornment. It was a dry movie, just the story. Impersonal, he just gave us the dry facts. God, that Russell Olson does the driest talks. And most damning of all, without butter. <laughs> Here's the thing. Dry is for machines. Don't repeat yourself is for machines, it's for mechanisms, it's for things you build that have to work. It may come as a surprise, but we are not machines. People thrive on redundancy, right? Read any literature and it's full of references back and forth and people saying the same thing just over and over. That's called character development, okay? People are not machines. So you don't want to, you don't want to have an explanation where you explain something for a long time and then just go right back and repeat it all over again. But you do want to explain something and then come back to it and say, do you remember when we talked about this? That's still important. So you want to repeat yourself enough. And so I actually have a different acronym for that. <laughs> and if you, if you find anything on the internet, you really can. That's Russell's Reserve Rye. <laughs> so, um, so why do you want to repeat yourself? You want to repeat yourself for emphasis. Let me say that again. You want to repeat yourself for emphasis. <laughs> but mostly you want to repeat yourself for context, right? You want to remind people of where what I'm talking about now fits in with what I've talked about before. So you don't want to like repeat huge sections of your explanation, but you don't want to do something like the IRS always does, right? If you ever fill out government forms, Right? They'll say something very helpful, like refer to section 9.7. What does it say in section, what's 9.7 about? Because keep in mind, 9.7 might be really, really important. It might have some little fact that you really want to know. <laughs> right? So it's just a little summary. Don't cut the red wire. <laughs> OK. So now we come to number five which is probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. And yes, that does break the rule. They put the most important thing first. Why am I doing that? Because I'm such an awesome explainer. I know I can carry you all along. Right? So the, most, the uh, most important thing has to do with this book. And I actually have a copy of it right here. It's called Numerical Methods That Work. You see, when I was in college, I think I was like a sophomore in college, I fell in love with this mathematical technique called numerical analysis, which is what this book is about. 
And I got a whole bunch of books out of the library, and instead of doing what I was supposed to be doing, I spent like the whole semester reading about numerical analysis and writing programs. And the details of numerical analysis aren't really important. The thing to keep in mind is that it's a mathematical technique that sometimes works brilliantly and very occasionally blows up horribly. Just awful, yet answers that aren't even close. And so I had all these books spread out on the library table, and I was next to a window, and the sun was streaming in. And this book, well, I bought this one on eBay. I didn't steal it from the library. This book was sort of sitting there like that, and the sun was hitting it. And I realized that there was like something else on the cover that looked like letters. You couldn't quite read it, but and it sort of, you know, I spent the next half hour like, what the, what is that? And eventually, I did that thing that people do with monuments sometimes. You get the piece of paper, and you put it down there, and you get the pencil, right? And you scribble all over it. And I did that a few months ago. And well, there's where the thing was. And I did that a few months ago, and I don't know if you can read it. Well, let me circle it, make it a little. <laughs> Here's the thing, it's one small joke. It's just a tiny little joke, and it's all the better. That's the only place where that word appears. It's nowhere else in the book you know, with the title. Nowhere else is there a hint that that usually is there. Right? It's one small joke, and here's the thing. I can't remember the title of any of the books I read that semester, except that one. I had absolutely no trouble finding that book on eBay a few months ago. It's one small joke that made me remember something for decades. So number five is mixing some humor, OK? Which brings up the question, are you funny? Right? If you are funny, let me just sort of step back, say, don't let the jokes overwhelm the explanation, but go. I have nothing more to say to you. What if you're sort of funny? I think of myself as sort of funny. I can be funny sometimes, right? So don't let the jokes get in the way. Subtle is better, right? That, that word is just kind of embossed there, waiting for somebody to find it. And for God's sake, don't explain the jokes. Jokes are not a place to explain anything. OK. But now we come to the hard case. What if you're not funny and you know it? You know you're not funny. Congratulations, you're head and shoulders above the people who aren't funny and don't know it, right? So that's, that's good. OK. It doesn't really matter if you're funny or not. Humor is one way to get to what I'm talking about, but it's not the only way. What I said mix in some humor. I really mean mix in some humanity, OK? You need to show up at your explanations. You need to be there. You need to let the person you're explaining things to know why it's important, right? I brought my book. That's the little piece of me that I brought. But if you think about this conference with all of the incredible speakers we've had, right? Sandy brought the baby, which is possibly the only time that those words will ever be uttered. <laughs> What more can I say? <laughs> ben brought God. Well, the God class, right? Ben was willing to say, here's some code that I'm not exactly proud of. Let me show it to you. That takes some stuff, right? Angela brought a cold, right? But she also brought her heart, right? Did anybody not feel that? Anybody not pay attention, right? You need to show up at your explanations. You need to show up, because explaining is one of the most important things you are going to do. Right? You write some code, and then you explain it for the rest of your life. Okay? You need to show up at your explanation. I could tell you all the stuff. Right? I could say that people are social animals, and that by showing up at your explanation, you provide an important social context. Or I could tell you that it just makes the explanation more fun, more interesting. But really, it just comes down to seven simple words. If you don't care, I don't care. So conference is almost over. It's been a great conference. 
You're all going to maybe go on the hike and then head home. I wish you a safe trip. They also wish that when you get back to your office, you think about what all of these techniques, but most of all, you, think, you start explaining. You start explaining because it will make your company better. It'll make your work environment better. It'll make the people around you better. It might even make the world better. And I think you're just the group of people to do it. Thank you all for listening. Oh, sure. I'd be happy to do questions if uh, anybody has any. Sir. Do it over and over and over. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the question was, how do, how do you? Well, it's hard for me to repeat the question. How, do you, how, do we, how does he get as good as me in presenting? And really, it's just all about practice. It's the first time I did this, I was an absolute nervous wreck and a disaster. And as the people over there in that corner will tell you, today, I was an absolute nervous wreck five minutes before this talk. Maybe it's not so disastrous. That's that's the difference. So, any, anyone else? Sir. I think you have to treat it as like an interactive kind of thing. I think you need to um, let people know when you're completely lost. Like you need to give them some rope. Like they might lose you, but they might get you again. But at some point, if you're completely gone, it was like I forget who was talking about the the bad pair programming kinds of things, you need to um, you know, pull on the rope. The other thing you can do is, so frequently the most common failure mode with an explanation is this gap. They've skipped over something that's not there. And you can help people explain things by saying, you know what, pretend I'm a third grader. Now explain it to me, right? No, I don't get that. Pretend that's a fifth grade explanation. Pretend I'm a third grader, you know, and pull them in and eventually, They'll say it, maybe. So. Anyone else? All right, thank you all again. <laughs>